Balancing your personal and professional life is crucial for realizing your ambitions. Your home and work lives must complement each other to ensure success. What you strive for in your career should enhance your home life, just as what occurs at home should support your career. If one aspect falters, it can adversely affect the other. Consider the case of a woman who consistently arrives early at work and leaves late every night. Despite her efforts, she doesn't seem to accomplish much more than her colleagues. It appears she might be using work to escape issues at home. Conversely, a man who frequently arrives late and leaves work early to attend to emergencies at home may be using these situations as excuses to avoid work. If there are problems at work, address them promptly or seek solutions elsewhere. Similarly, resolve issues at home by admitting and rectifying any neglect. Seek counseling or support from trusted individuals, as home problems often require time and patience to heal. Balancing work and personal time is essential for maximizing your ambition and potential. Problems in one area can impact the other, so it's crucial to manage both aspects effectively. Sometimes, work demands may encroach on personal time, but communicate with your family about these situations and ensure that their support is reciprocated. Psychologists highlight two significant sources of happiness, work and love. Achieving professional goals requires dedication, discipline, and constant learning. Similarly, nurturing personal relationships demands attention, love, and care. Investing in personal relationships is vital, as neglect can lead to significant losses in happiness and fulfillment. The effort you put into relationships directly impacts what you receive in return. Therefore, maintain an active investment in relationships and family. Life should be balanced to avoid negative consequences on relationships, health, spirituality, and overall well-being. Work on achieving a balanced life and ambitions, ensuring that neither aspect overshadows the other. Remember, neglecting any aspect of life can lead to detrimental consequences. If you're a believer, don't neglect your spirituality. Study and practice it to maintain balance and fulfillment in life. Neglect is the great destroyer of well-being, so prioritize maintaining balance in all aspects of life to prevent it from spiraling out of control. Here's one thing to consider if you've neglected your spirituality. If you're a believer, I'm not asking you to become one, but I'm asking that if you're a believer, do not neglect that part of your future. Study and practice your faith as diligently as you study and practice ambition, parenting, skills, and success in the marketplace. Faith helps sustain ambition. Another crucial aspect of your ambition is your physical health. Consider this advice on maintaining your physical well-being. Ancient scripture says to treat your body like a temple. Excellent advice. Treat your body like a temple, meaning it's something you take extremely good care of, not a woodshed. Here's why. The mind and the body work together. You've got to have both functioning well. Your body needs to be a good support system for the mind and the spirit supporting you with strength, energy, power, and vitality. Vitality is a major part of success. Feeling well is a personal responsibility. By taking care of the temple, your physical body, you're cherishing it. Sometimes the spirit is willing, but the body is weak, a sad combination indeed. You can't think of a much more pitiful combination than a willing spirit and a weak body. You must take care of your physical side because it's so important. Be conscious of your support system, but not self-conscious. You don't have to spend excessive amounts of time working on it. Even 30 minutes to an hour a day can suffice. Exercise is crucial. Find an exercise program that works for you, whether it's jogging, walking, swimming, or playing sports. Regular physical activity not only benefits your body, but also improves your mind. Take care of the physical side so that it becomes a happy support system, with the muscle, strength, and vitality to take you wherever you want to go and accomplish whatever you want to achieve. Pay attention to behaviors that could harm your physical health, such as overeating, smoking, or excessive alcohol consumption. These habits can destroy your temple just as surely as pure neglect. Moderation is key, and knowing your limits is crucial, especially in social or business settings. Maintain balance in life. Your ambition in the marketplace should translate into a balanced life at home. If you're giving too much at work, pay it back to your family with interest. Without balance, you may sacrifice your family for your work, which comes with a high price. Remember, 
Everything matters, and all disciplines affect each other. Don't be casual in your approach to life, business, and family. Everything matters. Strive for success and financial independence, but not at the expense of others. Wealth is not inherently evil. It's about using your talents and skills to take care of yourself and others. Become financially independent, but not at the cost of your values and morals. It's our natural destiny to grow, succeed, prosper, and find happiness. Empt the words, rich, and wealthy, with becoming financially independent. Pursue riches ethically, without misusing people or compromising your values. Remember, it's possible to achieve success without sacrificing your integrity. I quite agree. That language suits me fine. It didn't say it was impossible. It just said it was hard. I don't mind a little challenge. I'm also reminded that the Bible says, the meek shall inherit the earth. But where does it say that in order to be meek, you have to be poor? No, the Bible doesn't say you have to be poor. That's just an interpretation, a poor rationalization that lazy people use. People who need to justify their lack of progress. People who will give up in the midst of any adversity. People who don't even try. For everyone born in America or who comes to America, here's part of your heritage. The opportunity to become financially independent in a nation full of hope and promise. It's our heritage, our right, and within our reach to realize all the best that exists, including personal wealth. So let me give you now, by definition, the meaning of financial independence. And kids, listen up because this is straightforward language. Financial independence is the ability to live from the income of your own personal resources. The ability to live from the income of your own personal resources. That's what I describe as financial independence. Now, one part of it is how you want to live. Some people need millions for all the projects they've got going, all the causes they support. And here's what's exciting about America. What if you decided you had to be rich to do all the things you wanted to do, go all the places, support all the projects? What if you had to be rich? Are there books on the subject? Yes, of course, there's plenty of information on how to be rich. But if you don't have to be rich, you probably won't read the books. What drives you to go get the books is if you have to have the money. Now, some people don't need much money. I understand that. Some people lead modest lives. But financial independence, that I think is every American's heritage. Someday to become financially independent, the ability someday, someday to live off the income of your own personal resources. Wow, it's freedom of the most exciting kind, financial independence. Now, to get there, I assume that you've got this money thing settled, that it's okay to be rich and wealthy. It depends on how you earn it, of course. Success at the service of others, not at the expense of others. Wealth by rendering wealthy amounts of service. Everybody has got to weigh this for themselves, I understand that. But let's say that you'd like to go for becoming financially independent. Here's number one. It's a matter first of philosophy. The philosophy of the rich. Rich people invest their money and spend what's left. The difference in your economic future is going to be not the economy. The difference in your economic future is going to be your philosophy. So now let me teach you some of the best philosophy I know. What to do with a dollar. To begin with, never spend more than 70 cents. And here's a good plan for the remaining 30 cents. I suggest you take 10 cents out of every dollar and give it to charity. Here's why. Nothing teaches kids character better than generosity. It helps you teach so many things. Generosity, supporting worthy projects, taking a piece of what you've been blessed with and turning it back to help people who can't help themselves, worthy projects, charity. And the time to start is when the amounts are small. I'm telling you, if a kid understands this, he'll give you a dime out of every dollar once they understand. And it's easy to give a dime out of a dollar. It's a little tougher to give a 100,000 out of a million. Somebody says, oh, if I had had a million, I'd give a 100,000. I'm not so sure. That's a lot of money. We better start you early so you'll be ready when the big stuff comes. So, 10 cents for charity. Here's the next 10 cents. 10 cents for active capital. Active capital, active capital to try to make a profit. We live in a capitalistic society where the money belongs in the hands of the people, not in the hands of the government. So, you should turn part of your wages into capital and turn capital into a profit-making enterprise. It can be a piece of property, it can be anything, 
buy, sell, it doesn't matter what it is. Try to show a profit. And this is where I teach kids how to have two bicycles, one to ride and one to rent. Active capital fund because here's what I teach kids. Profits are better than wages. Kids need to know that the benefits of living in a capitalistic society. Kids can start a cool aid stand before they can get a job. Kids can clean out their rooms, have a garage sale to earn some profit. It doesn't take a kid long to figure out that profits are better than wages, better than allowances. And that's what America is all about, about a profit. And here's what's exciting about making a profit. You can make a profit long before you can legitimately earn a wage. There are no limits. Your profits can sometimes accelerate much faster than your wages. Teach your kids early. Profits are better than wages. Wages make you a living. Profits make you a fortune. And we should all try our hand at making a profit since we live in a capitalistic society. How long will it take to triple your wages? Currently, a while. But profits, there's no limit. My gosh, once I understood this, I went bonkers. Profits, the whole world benefits if we all leave more profit. Leave a profit, make a profit. I talked to a man who rents a lot of apartments. He said, Mr. Oh, you wouldn't believe it. Most people, when they leave the apartment, it's trash. I said, you've got to be kidding. He said, no, what a reputation. Everything you touch turns to trash, gets dirty. Got to turn that around. One of the best ways to train yourself is to leave a profit. A friend of mine has made money on every car he's bought. Why? Because when he traded it in or sold it, it was always better, better than he found it. The key for parents is to touch a life and leave it better than you found it. Touch a business and leave it better than you found it. Touch a job and leave it better than you found it. Whether you stay six weeks, six months, six years, always leave it better than you found it. Make a contribution, leave a profit. What a world this would be if everybody left a profit, not a piece of trash. Now, here's the third 10 cents, and you can become as wealthy as you want. The first 10 cents goes to charity, the second 10 cents goes to active capital, and the third 10 cents is for passive capital. Passive capital means let somebody else use some of your money. You're the passive partner, they're the active partner trying to make a profit. They'll pay you interest, and one of the most valuable things for your future is called compound interest. Nothing more valuable, and I suggest 10 cents for passive capital. Let someone else use it, pay you interest on it. Now, here's what else I teach kids. It's a Bible philosophy, and here's what it says. The borrower is servant to the lender. Excellent information. The borrower is servant to the lender. And if you've taught this properly and asked kids what do you want to be, here's what they'll tell you. They'll say, I want to be one of those lenders. That's the power position. If you're interested in power for the future, influence for the future, being rumor over much, I'm telling you, the key is to be one of those lenders, not a spender, a lender. Next, if you can't reach this little formula right now, if you can't start here, here's what you do. Start where you can and work toward it. 7010-1010 is the ideal. And it doesn't matter if you're trying to lose weight or to get your health in order or to get your finances in order. Next, in building your financial independence, is to keep strict accounts. You've got to know exactly where it comes from. You've got to know exactly where it's all going. Don't fall into the, I don't know where it all goes, trap. Don't fall into that, it just gets away from me, trap. No, keep strict accounts. It's much easier than it used to be with personal computers and so many households having software that's readily available. It's as easy as entering your deposits, checks, and receipts, and the computer will tell you exactly where you stand. And it does more than that. If you're really wondering where it all goes, the computer will tell you that too. Most of the programs let you categorize your expenditures, print it out, and you'll know exactly by category where it all goes. And when it's right there in front of you, you'll be able to evaluate what you're buying and what you're wasting. Take that wasting part and add it to one of your capital funds. It'll get you there that much faster. And here's another part of building your financial independence. It's a matter of attitude. First is philosophy about money, second is attitude about money. Here's the best attitude. All of us must pay for democracy, freedom, free enterprise, and a marketplace and a country second to none with gifts brought here from all over the world. 
I finally became a happy taxpayer once I was educated. You say, well, they misuse it. What do you care? That's not going to make any difference in your future, is it? That's not going to greatly reduce your chances to become rich and powerful. It shouldn't make any difference at all whether they misuse it or not. Sure, we need to vote well so the country is run as well as possible and as a level playing field as possible, but what if there isn't? I'm telling you, you can't base your life on that. Vote well and then chart your own course. Vote well and take charge of your own life. We've all got to pay, and after you pay your taxes, pay yourself first. Take care of the 30% first or whatever percentage you can start your plan with. Take care of the stuff off the top first and learn to live off the rest. Make your investments, whatever size they are, before you pay your bills. Give to charity before you buy the extra things you want. A man I know has an MBA from Harvard and an engineering degree from MIT, smart guy, semi-retired now and doing what he likes best, teaching. He teaches college courses in economics and business planning. But when he teaches economics, he also teaches personal economics. This is what he starts his classes with. Decide how you want to live now versus how long you want to work. Decide how you want to live now versus how long you want to work. This means if you want to spend everything you make now, you'll have to work longer and harder. But if you start investing in your financial future now, you'll have the choice between retiring early or traveling more or continuing your career or starting a new career later in life. Once again, it all comes down to choices. Think tomorrow today and live better tomorrow. Here's the next thing to think of when you're planning your economic future. Be careful with your credit cards. Selling money is big business. You probably get invitations in the mail to sign up for a new credit card a couple of times a month. Having some credit cards is important, especially if you travel. It's safer than cash. It's easier to track than cash. But be careful. I know that's hard when you buy something with a little piece of plastic. You don't feel the effect until you get the bill. So make sure that whatever you buy, you're still happy with your purchase after you get the bill. And be careful with credit. It's the easiest way to get into debt. Go into debt strategically, not habitually. If your business is high risk, if you're an entrepreneur whose career requires a great deal of risk and a great deal of strategic debt, keep the debt in your business and out of your personal life. I know this one's hard too because for most entrepreneurs looking for capital, the lender requires you guarantee the debt personally. So plan your debt just as you plan your fortune. Here's another point to remember in becoming financially independent. It's hard to get rich fast. It's easy to get rich slowly. 70, 10, 10, and 10 or whatever percentages you're working with. It doesn't happen overnight with conservative investments. It takes a while. It takes discipline to keep adding value to your future. A little every month, a little every month, a little every month. It takes time to build your fortune, your financial independence. There's a saying about investing. Time, not timing. The saying says, I'm. It takes time. Now, if playing the stock market is what you do, then you know that timing is a whole other ball game. But for the average person, it's time. A study was done a while back that analyzed stock market investments. The study took two scenarios into consideration. The first one took place over 40 years. In the first scenario, stocks were bought at the very worst possible time and sold at the very worst possible time. Bought high and sold low. And after 40 years, the average return was around 10%. Scenario 1 dealt with time. In the second scenario, stocks were analyzed over a 10-year period. The second scenario dealt with timing. Stocks were purchased at the best possible time and sold at the best possible time. After 10 years, the average return was around 10%. Be patient in building your financial independence. It will come, small steps at a time, little advantages after little advantages. It's hard to be patient, but it's just like building your ambition and achieving your goals. It happens one step at a time. And what if patience has nothing to do with building financial independence? What about those trust fund babies that are handed their financial independence on a silver platter? never having to work a day in their lives. The first car is a Porsche, the first house is a mansion, the first job is at daddy's company. What about those born rich? Some guy says it isn't fair that I'm working like crazy all day, all week, all month, all my life. It just isn't fair. I'll never have that kind of money. 
Well, some things aren't fair, like inheriting money. But what does that have to do with you, really? If your goal is to have greater financial independence than some of those you know, then you'd better start working harder and smarter on your goals, your own visions, and stop pondering what's fair and what isn't. Start examining what's keeping you back instead of what's keeping them ahead. Start looking at what you're doing. Start looking at you instead of it. There are plenty of stories, examples, and experiences of people who began their careers destitute and had enough resolve to do it until they had more than they ever dreamed of. Study the experiences of others who built their way to the top instead of those who were born there. And what if you decided you had to be rich? What if you really followed the power of your ambition and your life started turning around? Well, aside from getting on the right track, increasing your earning potential, decreasing the percent you spend, increasing the percent you save, invest, and give away, aside from all the benefits of achieving, there will also come some disappointments. Disappointments in the circle of friends you started with. One of the disappointments that come from achieving all you can be is in the people who choose to remain right where they are. They will chastise you for your accomplishments. They will abandon you for trying to become better. They will remain behind and say, boy, he's forgotten us now that he lives so well. And they'll probably say more than that. They'll probably gather in their little group and say all sorts of things to justify their own mediocrity. But remember, those who choose to stay behind have chosen their own path, an average path, a path of mediocrity. And those who have climbed above the crowd almost always wish they could return to their earlier friends, to embrace them in friendship and love and try to help them get out of their ruts, to share ideas of hope and inspiration. But it rarely happens. Jealousy builds a big wall, one that is almost impossible to break down. So as you change, your life will change, your friends will change, your circle of influence will change, and that's part of achievement and ambition and success, an ever-changing process required to become the person worthy of reaching your goals. There are many reasons why people don't build their ambition, strive to become better, be the best they can. Many reasons, but it only takes one. We talked about many fears in an earlier session and how to work to overcome them. But here's one we didn't talk about, risk. Different professions call for different levels of risk. There's an old saying, no risk, no reward. Maybe that's the case in life, I don't know. It's a personal decision, one you have to make regarding how much risk you're comfortable in taking with your life, your future, and your money. It's a personal decision. What I do know is that there are different types of ambition, and each has its own reward. The ambitions of a salesperson are different than the ambitions of a manager. The ambitions of a manager or an executive are different than the ambitions of an entrepreneur. The ambitions of an entrepreneur are different than the ambitions of an artist or a scientist or a teacher. With different levels of ambition come different levels of risk and different levels of reward. Salespeople are probably more able to handle risk than managers and professionals, and the higher the risk, the higher the earning potential. Entrepreneurs are probably even more risk-oriented. They have to be. An entrepreneur's ambition must overpower the risk of losing it all in an attempt to gain their dream. Your level of ambition may or may not be equated with your ability to take on risk. Most people can't deal with so much failure to reach success. There are only a few people, even among the most ambitious, that have the tenacity, intestinal fortitude, and tolerance level to follow a risky ambition. Whatever the level of ambition, whatever the level of risk, there must always be the discipline to overcome the failures and see the end result, to keep trying until. Jonas Saul kept working through his failures until he developed the polio vaccine. Whatever your level of ambition, keep doing it until you get there. The riskier the ambition, the greater need for stability in your personal life. If you've got everything on the line in your business, you'll want to make sure everything is in line at home. Remember, the first step is to define a plan. It may not be ideal, but you're taking the first steps. And when you follow your plan, the money you put away today will help you build your financial independence tomorrow. And with financial independence, the result of your ambition, the reward of your ambition, with financial independence comes freedom like you've never known. B. Self-appreciation emphasizes acknowledging your accomplishments, recognizing your potential, and understanding that appreciating yourself and your achievements will continually fuel your ambition. It's an integral part of success. You must cultivate a strong appreciation for your own style, methods, and processes. There is no one-size-fits-all definition for success. 
It's not determined by popular trends or external philosophies. Success is the continuous progress towards your personal goals, which you define for yourself, not dictated by external factors like best-selling books or imposed philosophies. It's not measured by the amount of money in your bank account, but by the steady progress you make towards becoming the person you want to be and achieving what you desire for yourself, your family, and your business. This includes spiritual, health, and personal goals, those that bring you satisfaction and joy. Success is subjective. My definition may differ from yours. There's no universal formula for success, no specific financial status or appearance required. Success is about your own consistent progress towards the goals you set daily, weekly, and monthly for your life, your business, and your family. For example, if someone decides to leave conventional life behind and live in a cabin in the mountains, living off the land, and they successfully achieve it, they are a success in my eyes. Success defies stereotypes. There's no one right way to achieve it. It's a combination of various philosophies and ideologies that resonate with your own beliefs. We need diverse perspectives to broaden our minds, appreciate different viewpoints, and reinforce our own convictions. By exposing ourselves to a wide range of thoughts, philosophies, and ideologies, by listening to different speakers and reading various books, we enrich our understanding and become better equipped to navigate life's challenges. No single source has all the answers. It's the amalgamation of influences that shapes our decisions and relationships. And here's another crucial aspect. A diversity of perspectives. Different viewpoints can be incredibly valuable. Someone might ask, have you ever considered it from this angle? And you might realize you hadn't. So, you step into their shoes, look back, and think, wow, I never thought about it that way before. It's eye-opening. Embrace the wealth of mental stimulation and exercises. Always maintain a thirst for learning. No matter how far you've come or where you stand on your journey to success, keep that eagerness to learn alive. Absorb as much knowledge as you can, then engage in debate. Lay it all out on the table, dissect it, turn it around, scrutinize it, and question it. Don't blindly accept one person's viewpoint as the ultimate truth. Take in their knowledge, but don't let it be the only knowledge. Ensure that your conclusions, your approach, your appreciation of your style, methods, and achievements are truly your own. It's valuable to consider what others say, but don't simply follow it without question. Evaluate the source, then chart your own path. Engage with ideas, take notes, but also engage in debate. Be a student, not a follower. Crafting your ambition is a unique process for each of us. Gather knowledge, then shape your approach based on your own conclusions, not someone else's. Beware of falling for others' philosophies. Collect knowledge, sift through it, find what's valuable, and then develop your own philosophy. Your philosophy should become one of your primary guiding lights. Debate the plans, philosophies, and approaches of others. Understand that these decisions impact everything, from your own plan and self-worth to how you value time. Speaking of time, Here's a secret. Rich people and poor people both have about 24 hours in a day. What sets them apart is how they manage that time. Simple disciplines, consistently applied, can transform your life, your future, and your income. Discipline is key in time management, too. So, let's discuss a few strategies to manage time better. Firstly, consider ignoring the subject altogether. If you've always struggled with time management, admitting it might not change, at least not immediately. This honest acknowledgement can be liberating. Remember, nobody's ideas of success or time management are one size fits all. It's crucial to resist all stereotypes and models of success so, here's an alternative perspective on time management, ignore it. Don't let anyone pressure you into a rigid schedule. Resist the urge to conform to someone else's idea of how you should spend your time. Take advice, but don't take orders. Accept only the opinions that resonate with you and reject those that don't. Resist all attempts to force you into a predefined model of success. Find your own rhythm and pace, aligned with what feels right for you. Another alternative to traditional time management is to simplify tasks. Instead of tackling overwhelming challenges, consider stepping down to something more manageable. Consider an alternative approach that doesn't demand excessive time or effort. For instance, some individuals in sales are promoted to managerial positions, 
only to find themselves overwhelmed by the responsibilities. They realize that managing entails long hours and constant worry, prompting them to revert to their sales roles. Similarly, someone may aspire to own a company, only to discover the immense pressure and time commitment involved. They may ultimately decide to step down from such ambitions in pursuit of a more balanced life. Don't allow yourself to be pressured into situations that compromise your well-being. A poignant example is a little girl who yearns for her father's attention. Despite his love for her, his demanding job leaves him with little time for family. In such cases, it might be wise to join a slower group to prioritize family over career ambitions. Reflect on the consequences of your choices. Sometimes, pursuing additional wealth or status comes at the expense of meaningful relationships. It's essential to strike a balance and prioritize what truly matters, such as family. The ultimate alternative to time management lies in maximizing personal productivity. By tapping into your potential, you can achieve as much in an hour as you once did in ten. Focus on efficiency, skill development, and continuous improvement. This approach allows you to accomplish more within a standard workday, making the most of your time. There's a growing trend of remote work arrangements, where individuals set up home offices and telecommute. Freed from office distractions, tasks are completed more efficiently. While not everyone has this luxury, similar principles can be applied in traditional office settings. Establish, do not disturb, times, schedule focused work periods, and prioritize tasks based on productivity rhythms. Personal development plays a crucial role in this process. Recognize your value and leverage your strengths to work smarter, not harder. Understand your optimal work patterns and strive for efficiency in completing tasks. Let me share some additional insights on time management. It's crucial to understand that either you control the day or it controls you. The key to effective time management is maintaining control over your schedule. Often, what happens is that initially, you're in command, but as time progresses, you begin to lose control. Whether it's running a business or managing other responsibilities, it's essential to periodically reassess who's in charge. Remember this fundamental truth. Something will dominate and something will serve. Your goal should be to become the master, ensuring that you dictate the course of your day, your business, or your endeavors. Here's how you can maintain that mastery. 1. Set clear goals asterisk. Keep your goals documented and accessible at all times. Prioritize them based on their importance and relevance to your objectives. 2. Follow a game plan asterisk. Align your goals with a well thought out game plan. Separate major tasks from minor ones and allocate your time accordingly. 3. Distinguish major from minor asterisk. Evaluate whether each task or interaction is major or minor. Invest adequate time and preparation in major endeavors, while minor ones may require less effort. 4. Don't mistake activity for accomplishment asterisk. Busy doesn't always equate to productive. Evaluate your daily activities to ensure they contribute meaningfully to your goals. 5. Cultivate concentration asterisk. Focus on the task at hand without distractions. Begin your workday when you're fully engaged and avoid mixing work with other activities like breakfast or commute. 6. Learn to say no asterisk. Be selective about commitments and avoid overextending yourself. Prioritize activities that align with your goals and values. 7. Appreciate your time asterisk. Recognize your limits and prioritize personal time with loved ones. Be mindful of commitments that detract from your well-being or family time. Success isn't solely about achieving significant milestones, but also about recognizing and appreciating the small victories along the way. By effectively managing your time and focusing on incremental progress, you pave the way for long-term success and fulfillment. I define leadership as the challenge to rise above mediocrity, to embrace new challenges and opportunities. It is said that as Abraham Lincoln stood by his dying mother's bedside, her final words urged him to be somebody, Abe. If this anecdote holds truth, Lincoln evidently took it to heart, propelling himself to greatness from that moment onward. In the role of leadership, attracting high-caliber individuals hinges on one's own commitment to excellence. Leadership is the capacity to draw others to the talents, skills, and opportunities one presents, whether as a business owner, manager, or parent. 
I view leadership as life's ultimate challenge, manifesting across diverse domains such as science, politics, industry, education, and sales. And here's a significant challenge, one of the greatest, parenting. The paramount challenge of leadership is parenting, not merely preparing our salespeople and business colleagues for the 21st century, but also readying our children for it. Now, what's crucial in leadership is refinement. All exceptional leadership continuously refines itself until it achieves refinement and effectiveness. Here are some refinements. Learn to be strong but not rude. This refinement involves the additional steps to becoming a potent, capable leader with extensive influence. Some individuals mistake rudeness for strength. However, it's not a suitable substitute. Next, be kind but not weak. We must not confuse kindness with weakness. Kindness is a form of strength. We must be kind enough to convey the truth to others, considerate enough to be forthright, and refrain from indulging in delusions. Further, learn to be bold but not a bully. Winning the day and pursuing ambitions require boldness. You must be willing to confront challenges head on. While farming isn't an easy task, to reap a harvest, one must be bold and seize opportunities. Next, be humble but not timid. Timidity won't lead you to the high life. Humility, on the other hand, is a virtue, a recognition of the vastness of the universe and our place within it. Humility acknowledges the uniqueness of the human experience. Here's another refinement. Be proud but not arrogant. Pride is necessary for achievement, community, and accomplishment. However, it's crucial to maintain pride without veering into arrogance. The worst kind of arrogance stems from ignorance, which is hardly tolerable and can be costly. Consider a cautionary tale. A young newlywed couple, buoyed by their pride, received money from their parents to purchase new patio furniture. The young couple heads to the store and selects the perfect set. They proceed to the checkout where the clerk scans the UPC code. Upon noticing that there are four chairs in the container but they are only being charged for one, the couple brings it to the clerk's attention. However, the clerk dismisses them arrogantly, insisting that she knows her job and scan the container herself. Despite the couple's attempts to explain the error, the clerk refuses to listen. In the end, the young couple manages to require four beautiful patio chairs for the price of one. It seems unlikely that the stall clerk will change her arrogant attitude when it comes time to reconcile her cash drawer. Probably not. Ignorant arrogance is the worst kind. If a guy's smart and arrogant, we can tolerate that, but if a guy's dumb and arrogant, I mean, that's just too much to take. And here's the next one. Humor without folly. That's important for a leader. Humor, yes, but folly, no. In leadership, we learn it's okay to be witty but not silly, fun but not foolish. Next, deal in realities, deal in truth. Save yourself the agony. Just accept it as it is. Life is unique, accept it as unique. Some people call it tragic, but I'd like to think it's unique. The whole drama of life is unique, fascinating. Here are some leadership studies, and I want to give you the list first, and then we'll come back and go through this list and take them one at a time opportunity, ability, inevitability, and rationality. Here's the first one, opportunity. Opportunity means springtime, to be able to recognize this is a good time, this could be the spring we've been looking for, with all of the components to make spring unique, as we see it through the summer and harvest it in the fall. They seize the moment, and that's what you must do with opportunity, seize the moment, whether the moment might be someone you see standing there, and you say, I should introduce myself and tell my story, or at least say hello and see if the window will open a new opportunity, seizing the moment, not letting opportunity slip away. Be a student of when it's the right time, be a student of when this is the moment, this could be the year, the first three months of the next year to set up the year 2000. You say, I'm going to recognize this as a new opportunity for me to really pour it on these first three months. I'm calling it springtime, putting together an artificial spring in an industrialized society. It's hard to recognize when is spring, when is summer, when is harvest. So sometimes you have to sort of manufacture a spring. Learning to recognize opportunity, be a student of opportunity. Next is ability, human ability, as we ponder and think back over as much history as you know. We've mastered what human beings have done in the last 6,000 years, and especially what human beings have done that we know more particularly about in the last couple of hundred years since the birth of America. 
especially us, who are Americans, but the last, let's say, thousand years of the Renaissance, walking hopefully out of the Dark Ages when there was a whole burst of freedom of thought, craft, artist, genius, music. It seems like all of these unique architectures, all of these things, sort of began to awaken almost simultaneously, and within a few short years, everything seemed to be bursting forth like a variety garden called the Renaissance. But that helps us to understand human ability is just incredible. Given the right moment, given the right opportunity, given the right climate, given the right season, human beings can think, create, and do the most extraordinary things. It was there, but nobody ever recognized it. It was there, but nobody offered them a helping hand, saying, come, we'll teach. Nobody offered the opportunity to say, come, we'll recognize. We will help you start. We will help you build. Not having that opportunity before, and now having it, We've watched the most extraordinary things happen with people who seemingly others said didn't have the ability, but sure enough, they did. Now it's awakened. Now, here's what I want you to discover in this study, and that is your own ability. Part of it you discover as you go, skill by skill, language by language, ability by ability, yours can grow. You've got it. The key is to use it. Yes, you can learn to do this. But how about this, and how about the next step? And how about the next step? Don't stop now that you've gotten started. Don't stop on your journey to study and tap and utilize your own personal ability. Here's the next one that's vitally important, and that's the study of inevitability. As leaders, we must be students of inevitability. What is inevitable? Here's a little scene, 350 feet from Niagara Falls, in a little boat with no motor and no oars. We call this scene inevitable. It's over if you find yourself in such an unfortunate position. It's already lost. 300 feet from Niagara Falls, little boat, no motor, no oars. It's over. It's already done. Even though you haven't crashed over the falls, even though that experience hasn't yet occurred, you're now in this unfortunate position, and it's called inevitable. I raise this issue because what you don't want to be caught in is in those inevitable positions where either through carelessness or whatever, Rather than find yourself 300 feet from Niagara Falls, if someone would have painted the roar of the falls sufficiently for you way upstream, or maybe they had seen an experience of someone who reached that inevitable point, you know, and then they were lost. If enough of those scenes were painted, then you probably wouldn't have been so careless to have found yourself in that position. And that's really what life is all about. Learning from the experiences of others that have either witnessed or have been in these inevitable positions where, because of mistakes and because of failure and because of carelessness, they have found themselves in this inevitable position, and sure enough, it was too late, you crossed the line. We must teach our children that there are certain points in life that are inevitable, the disaster is inevitable, the heartbreak is inevitable. I learned it in economics. I found out early, you know, you could make 5,000 a month and go broke. Way back then, 5,000 a month was a lot of money, and I used to say, how could you go broke if you made 5,000 a month? And the answer was simple, spend 6,000. And if you're making 5,000, it's easy to spend that other 1,000 and just not realize it. It just gets away, so, it is easy to go broke making 5,000 a month. Just spend 6,000, and it's inevitable. You know, if you don't change your ways, if you don't recognize it soon enough, if somebody doesn't come along and sort of ring the alarm bells quick enough, sure enough, the inevitable will come. You spend more than you make. One of my friends says, you know, if your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep becomes your downfall. And there finally comes a point when it's inevitable. So, don't find yourself there, but be a student. You know, if I keep up my present direction, where will it take me? If I keep up my present discipline, where will that take me? And my lack of discipline is accumulated over some period of time. Time. Where will that lead me? You know, if you don't get enough of this nutrient, it's inevitable over a certain period of time. And this combined with this, now it is truly inevitable. Someday, too late, and unless there's some adjustment, somebody to tell the story, you say, Mary, it's inevitable. So, the key is to be a student of inevitability, so that you don't find yourself in that impossible position where you've crossed the line, and now it's too late. Next, and the last one, is to be a student of rationality. How to be a speed thinker, how to grasp problems and take them apart and put them back together in rapid fashion, 
how to ponder something and then make sure you know that it fits you, it fits your philosophy, it fits what you want to accomplish. Rationality. A very important subject to study, learning to put things through your own mind. We are usually only going to act on something that's important if it makes sense to us. Now, sometimes what makes sense to us leaves us still a little bit short of what we should know, you know, for the full expanse of knowledge to do a lot more things. But we can only really move as quickly as things make sense to us. Sometimes we step out by faith, but it makes sense to us to use our little faith. It makes sense to us to take a chance. It makes sense to us to make the investment first and then hope for the harvest. But if it doesn't make sense, if it isn't rational, then we're probably not going to act. We have to learn to study our own rationality, what makes sense to us. And then, here's what is the opportunity we have, is to try our best to make it make sense to somebody else. If you make the presentation in such a way that it's obvious, it's logical. I can see it, it makes sense to me. That's the way it seems to be, so we will act on that. If you'll get good at that, I'm telling you, you can affect a lot of people's lives. Now, here's the best rationality. We call it common sense. Humans have been given this extraordinary ability to use their brain power to come up with what we call common sense, right? Yes, I've heard all of this, but common sense tells me that looks like that's an exaggerated story, not a real story. Common sense tells me, so, part of it is to trust your common sense, but also to be willing to expand your common sense. What seemed to be common sense four or five years ago was a little short. Now, I understand common sense is to think of it this way and this way. So, this subject of rationality is vitally important. Continually looking for ways, whether it's style or content or product or presentation or understanding, keep studying the craft to make sure you keep up with the latest, not only in the technology of developing products. So, the responsibility of leadership goes all the way from the top to the bottom, and wherever you find yourself today, myself in my position here, my position as a father, You've got to be a student father. If you're a mother, congratulations. I advise you to continue being a student mother. How could you be more effective as a mother this year versus last year? What new stories could you gather that would be valuable when you have a chance to talk to your children about some specific challenges or problems? That's called continually being a student parent, because we should all continue to be students. Many of you have already become leaders, but here's the key, and that is to be a student leader, always studying ways to make your leadership more effective, your communication more dynamic, your understanding more expansive, your compassion a little deeper, your willingness to listen a little better, comprehending and turning it into something valuable that you can give back. That mechanism now starts to work better and better, working better as each year passes.